Hey, hi, everybody. Um, hope everybody can hear me. So I'm just going to wait a little bit for uh, people to show up in here, and then we'll get started. If you're watching this uh, later on YouTube, hopefully people should start coming pretty soon. Oh, hey. Hi, can you hear me all right? Um, hey, Stephen, I can't see you or hear you yet but hopefully it will work. Let's wait for a couple more people. Hello? Oh, hey. How's cool. it going? Good. I can hear you now. Hey, so thanks for joining. Yeah. yeah I've been looking forward to this. I've been uh, trying to work on nice. bug fixes. Morning. Oh, hey, Luca. <laughs> That's good. That's good evening, good. I guess, for you. Uh, no, by now it's actually morning. Just oh, okay. past 12. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just realizing, I don't know if everybody got to notice that I was moving the Hangout up earlier, so um, I don't know how many people will actually join, but um, yeah, I guess we'll let's start. Guys. Let's start, and um, you know, we can keep it short, and I can always do it again if we need to. So I guess today's... Uh, well, agenda, I would like to first go over the, the recent changes in Vulkan, uh, because I'm guessing not everybody knows about them, and then talk about the, the next steps, like in terms of you know, larger uh, roadmap items. So first, uh, let me see if I can share my screen. So this post, uh, it's not published yet. It's still a draft, but uh, this is the, the recap of all the new stuff in uh, 1.8.3. And there's a couple breaking changes. Uh, so I, I thought maybe I could explain them here. So the first one is that up to now, uh, we supported having a field name, you know, categories, for example, in your database, so in your JavaScript schema, and then using the same name in your GraphQL schema. But the problem is that when you have a mutation or something, um, you know, the, the database field ex expects uh, an array of strings, for example, an array of category IDs. And the GraphQL field wants to give it like an array of um, object or something. So there was kind of a conflict there. And I resolved it by trying to guess the contents of the GraphQL field. It didn't really work. So I decided to just uh, make it so that from now on you have to give them different names. So it might require some uh, you know, database migrations, but I think it's worth it because it really simplifies the code and the, the overall like concept of dealing with both schemas. And then the other uh, change, other breaking change, up to now, any field in your JavaScript schema was um, added to your GraphQL schema. Now. It did, doesn't mean that it was necessarily accessible, but it was part of the API. It was part of the schema. Um, so let's say you had a, a you know, secret ID field. It would be part of the schema. Even if people can't view the ID, they would know there is a field by that name. So I changed that so that only fields with one of these three properties mm -hmm. uh, are part of the GraphQL schema, which I think is more like how you'd expect it to work. 
um, the reason it's a breaking chain is that maybe up to now you were kind of relying on on the the previous implicit um, behavior, and now you will have to add one of these, you know, probably viewable by uh, to make it in, available in the GraphQL schema. Okay, what else? So um, we're upgrading to React 16. So uh, a big thanks to uh, Lucas' hard work. Uh, it's really cool. Uh, I've been upgrading my own projects. It seems to work really well. The only problem, in a way, is that sometimes if you know you have to up upgrade your package JSON file manu manually because uh, you might not be working on a fork of the core uh, repo or something or the starter repo. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to make sure that uh, I can uh, repeat the information so people don't have to hunt down the, the right versions. Because if you, you know, if you just go to the latest version of for every package, you might get uh, issues with uh, incompatibilities. So anyway, that's kind of a pain. You have to double check the versions. But apart from that, it seems to work great. Uh, what else is new? Um, there are new uh, packages for. for analytics and event tracking. So the way it works now, which I think is kind of in keeping with how Vulkan works generally, is that you have uh, four um, functions you can call in it, identify page user, which are kind of generic event tracking and analytics tracking uh, functions imported from the events package. And then, um, can hook into these and kind of do their own thing. So you can call a user to identify uh, when a new user is created, and then Intercom can hook into that for their own user tracking. A segment can do the same, Google Analytics or whatever. So the idea is you would only um, you would only call this or track once in your code, and then you can add providers in the back end uh, transparently. By the way, if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. I'm not watching the the chat window right now, but um, I can still hear you. Um, so GraphQL documentation, yeah, that's also pretty cool. Um, maybe I can show you real quick. Um, so If I type a query, OK, um, oh, this is not going to work. Well, Anyway, um, OK, of course, it never works when you want it to. Um, yeah, this should be documented. Well, anyway, once it works, I, maybe I haven't updated this specific project or something. But anyway, you'll have uh, um, documentation now for all arguments, uh, types, uh, and so on. So that, that will be pretty cool. Um, what else? Uh, there's a lot of smaller uh, improvements. Uh, one thing that's pretty cool, I think, is this new way of passing data to forms. So I had this issue where um, I needed to pre-fill a form field, like maybe you want to let people select a category from a dropdown, and you want to populate the category dropdown from your category selection. So now there is a pretty easy way where you can uh, pass a query to the form field, and it will kind of add it on to the rest of the queries used to fetch the forms data. And then you can access it uh, based on its uh, query name here and use that to populate the value and label uh, array, that gives you your select options. So the main idea is really like you can now 
add extra bits of queries, right? So that, that's pretty cool. Um, and of course, it's GraphQL, so you can make something more complex, and you can kind of shape the data you want and uh, get your form data this way. Um, and there's a lot of other things, but I'll let you uh, read the post once it's published. OK. So um, well, any questions so far? Um, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Great question. OK. <laughs> Great question. Can you hear me? Um, now I'm kind of confused. I was, uh, I was, I thought we were going to meet like uh, 6 p.m. Uh, standard, uh, a month standard time. It's four. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I I just figured out. No like, worries. Um, it wasn't. I didn't like. I should have mentioned people when I changed the time. Forgot that. Not everybody checks the, the Slack all the time. Um, my bad. Okay. Uh, so what did you get, just go through? Like, what's the so we, I basically just went through the, the latest updates because I, I wrote up a, a change log post, which I haven't published yet, but I just wanted to give people a quick recap if in case they're watching the video in the future. Um, and, and just you know to kind of recap the, the work that's gone into Vulcan over the past couple months or weeks. So um, okay. yeah, that, that's about it. You didn't miss that much. OK. What is, do you have a like a kind of a, like a timeline, time frame that you could introduce? Well, do you, that's what, do you have like some features? Yeah, that's what uh, I want to talk about now is uh, upcoming features and uh, the main areas of, uh, of work for the next couple months. So um, I guess there's, uh, there, there's maybe two main areas, I think, that I want to discuss today. One, is uh, upgrading uh, Apollo, and then the other one is maybe moving away from Bootstrap. So, uh, well, starting with Apollo, um, there's actually a version 2.0 or 2. whatever of Apollo client uh, that came out recently, and we're still on 1. Point something, 1.6 maybe. And uh, it, it'd be nice to upgrade, if only to kind of you know not get left behind. The problem is it's a pretty major change. So um, for example, um, Redux is not a dependency of Apollo anymore. It kind of doesn't work with Redux. So if anybody is using, is relying on Redux in that way, it could be a problem. Now, this is something we need to figure out because in Vulkan, you don't really need Redux. At least I almost don't use it. Like The only way I would use it is when I need to maybe track something a toggle, uh, you know, is the sidebar open or closed, or uh, or is the the site in mobile or desktop view something like that on a global basis? But it's really small things. So for my use case, it would be easy enough to get rid of Redux. Uh, but if it's a problem for uh, other people, we should figure that out first before we kind of break everything. And then I guess there's just the work of actually making the switch. And um, also seeing if it still works fine with our uh, reducers in like with list and all the code that kind of takes care of automatic uh, updating of your data. Um, so that yeah, I guess there's two steps. First step: Do we actually want to do it? Uh, do do we need to find a, an answer to the Redux solution? That's something we need to decide, and then actually do it. So. Ideally, it'd be great if someone like if that could be a task for one person that can take take the lead on that. Um, this would definitely uh, lighten my own load. So I don't know if there's any volunteers here that would like to work on that. If, if no one's raising the hand, um, I'm I'm committed to Polo Two uh, at our weekly hangout. Oh, not weekly, like monthly hangout. Yeah. And um, so I, I want to talk about Apollo 2. So therefore, I somehow have to get into it. <laughs> and I started reading up, up on it. Um, no, it was, I mean, I can say, yes, I would take the lead and look into it. 
but I'm not sure how fast I'm gonna gonna be. Okay. Yeah, I think we don't need to be that fast. Like, um, you know, in open source, I feel it's sometimes it's better to take it slow and avoid burnouts rather than try to always run after the latest update and latest version because you get tired really fast if you do that. So okay. yeah, yeah, I can I can I can look into this. Cool. So I guess the first thing, yeah, I'll just ask on the Slack, you know, what people think about that and Redux and so on. Um, but it, I mean, it's something we need to do it anyway. So yeah, we need something, someone to work on it. Uh, other thing was uh, Bootstrap. So the current situation, we kind of have a dependency on Bootstrap, which you know isn't great because um, people might want to use Material UI or something else. But really, it's a very light dependency because it's only um, we have modal windows, which wouldn't really work, wouldn't be functional without the, the Bootstrap CSS and, and the Bootstrap code. And then we have uh, forms. Um, the forms are a bit more complex because they use uh, Form C, React, Bootstrap, whatever. Um, and there's more different elements in them. There's even stuff like the date picker. Like I'm not even sure where that gets its styles from. Uh, but yeah, what I would like to do ideally is kind of move towards uh, something like style components, where the style is inside the component, and then you don't have any dependency on any you know external library or even any CSS file. So uh, that simplifies things a lot, I think. And also, it's themable. Uh, you can you can do a lot. Of so um, the only thing holding me back is I'm not sure if there is a good form library for style components, or would we have to code everything ourselves? And same with the, the modal window. Like, is there a, a model that works using style components? Um, maybe, or do we kind of break apart like the the model behavior and the model styling. Um, I'm not sure about that. And uh, yeah, if we could do that, uh, especially the forms, then we could just get rid of Bootstrap altogether. And I think it would make Vulkan a lot more flexible, like on the the front end side of things. Uh, any thoughts on this? Um, um, okay. I'll go ahead. Oh, yeah. So I have my own packages for component related items. I got rid of most, like, all of React Bootstrap's uh, dependencies. And I just have all of it in, in, in another package. I just call it whatever uh, React Strap. But I just noticed that I might still have a React. I, I well, I'm using the component, the form components heavily, so you can see there. Um, I wasn't thinking about it. I thought it, like it's all handled by Formc React. Yeah, but Formc React itself has a Formc React Bootstrap uh, like dependency. It's a separate like package, but. So you know you could not use that, but then it gets um, it's still a lot of work to switch out every form component. I think. Um, but ideally, yeah, if we just didn't have any, like if we only had the code for forms, uh, and then if people want to use Material UI or whatever, uh, they can just add that on top of it. I think that would be the best solution, um, rather than you know try to accommodate every like Bootstrap and Material UI and Whatever else, semantic, just kind of have a super light, uh, basic thing. Because the problem is, if if you don't have if you don't have anything, then you know the forms and the models and everything, it just won't really work. It, you know, it will work technically, but it will be uh, really hard to use and look really bad, and then it makes just a, for a bad uh, user experience for uh, new users. So for me, it was very important that forms kind of look decent out of the box. And that's why I, I went the bootstrap route rather than just being like, well, here's some ugly forms and uh, figure it out yourself. Yeah. So the, the reason why it changed to React Strap is you can, every component has 
the ability to change its tag type possible with React Strap, uh, React Bootstrap. Um, but other than that, I mean, I didn't really care on which Bootstrap version I'm on. I could still work with uh, 0 0.30, which does not have an issue with the models. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, my 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 my, issue, my biggest issue with the tag kind of thing. So on links, you can change tags to diff instead of a tags. Oh, okay. And those things make uh, like get rid of most of the um, the 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 arrows that React throws. Once you have like dependencies, like you can't have a diff within a a p tag, or mm. you can't have an a tag within an a tag, right? Those things. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, that made it easier for me to to use React Strap. Okay. So, but yeah. So to recap, I think best thing to do would be, you know, use style components or a similar uh, alternative, and kind of go the, the the no library routes where we just like. Or, or when I say no library, I mean no like external library because style components does have some libraries, but then your, you know, your uh, everything is packaged, so you only use, you only import the code and use the code that you actually need. You don't need to load a whole uh, huge style sheet for a tons of components you never need. That's that's one of the main problems I feel with Bootstrap and other uh, libraries like that. So let, let's try to do that. Um, I don't know if anybody here wants to take the lead on this. Otherwise, we can also ask other community members, of course. Yeah, I could definitely see into that, so. OK, awesome. Um, I know there is there is at least one uh, style component library called, what's it called? Is it Rebase? If you looked into the style component. Yeah, the, um, the style component library from Max Max Stoiber. Uh, I didn't know he had a library. Uh, but there's, I don't know if it's. I thought it was his library. Uh, it's the style components thing that gets a lot of traction. I have never course, looked. I, I have not yet looked into it. I mean, yeah. I mean, style components. I, I know about style components, but um, which is the library, I guess. But I, I was thinking about library in terms of like UI library, like Bootstrap, like a component library. Oh, so, okay. Because that would save us the time of having to write our own styles. So there is uh, this rebase thing, which we could use. Um, does it have forms? I, I don't know. It has a lot of things. Yeah, input. The first thing that comes up is Git tutorial. <laughs> I mean, if there was like a style components version of Bootstrap or something. That or semantic UI or anything else that already kind of looks nice, that would be ideal. But yeah, rebase could be good. Um, I don't think I'm searching for style components model. Um, Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, really... the... hmm? I mean, yeah, there there isn't like a big ecosystem of pre-existing components for style components. Um, but anyway, we can write our own, I guess. And so our uh, next item, oh yeah, Luca, I know you wanted to talk about the documentation. Oh, yeah, so we'll probably have to find some way or some commitment to really get, keep those things up to date. Like just yesterday, one of my students just said that he tried to get into Vulkan and it was just, he didn't, couldn't make too much sense of the documentation, especially since like some parts of it were already out of date because the 1.8.3 uh, update article wasn't published and the documentation wasn't updated yet to reflect the before and after changes regarding to the callbacks and stuff like that. So we probably have to either 
like just say plain like we only release once there's actually an update article available so there's you know people don't have mm. to go through the commit uh, commitives to just see what what actually changed yeah especially when they're not in slack or whatever yeah yeah definitely um yeah i'm not sure uh what to do exactly about that like it's just uh it's just hard to yeah. manage everything <laughs> um i mean it would help of course if somebody else wrote those posts like somebody else went through the commits and and did that but it's a lot of work um um i guess maybe the the easiest thing is just it, whenever you see something that's wrong in the documentation or unclear, just leave a GitHub issue and then go through existing issues and submit PRs. Um, yeah, I don't know. A any suggestions? Like, well, one small thing could be just to have, like, right into the contributing.md, just that people, if they have a time, just already having like a small patch note thing within their PR so you can just cut paste it for the article or, or whatever. So you don't have to like write everything or at least have a mm. certain guideline. That might um, be an idea. Yeah, maybe. I wonder if it's also, Maybe it's not clear that you can like contribute to the the docs as well. Maybe it could be. Well, It'd be great the docs to like... have like way fewer stars than everything else. That's true. Yeah. Documentation is tough. It's hard to keep it up to date. Uh, the only the only thing I can think of. I don't know, the code somehow. Or, or, um, or you have some step in the, in the engine. In charge of making sure you got pull request. You, you tag somebody that you the kind of go through that, and then you tag somebody else. Uh, I just, I just like nothing more psychological. Yeah, I mean, you're you're right about generating them from the the code. Like I've been trying to do that more. Um, so like I've been trying to document callbacks and settings and other things like that inside the the code base itself, and I think that will help. Um, uh, but then you you have to make people aware that these pages exist. So. Oh, uh, but actually, uh, yeah, something that could really help is um, I've been working on a new tutorial that's going to be like uh, uh, interactive, or where, where you can, uh, as you, you as you edit the code of the tutorial example package itself, it kind of steps you through the steps of the tutorial, and so I think that will be a good uh, place to kind of do the onboarding onto the project and uh, give people, you know, show people where information is available. And maybe, like the last step could be, hey, here's how you can contribute. Like you can check the issues here. You can improve the docs there. Because um, I think right now one of the problems is there isn't like well, there's the the examples for onboarding, but maybe it's still not super clear. Now. There's not like a single tutorial, a single flow for new users. So that's what I've been working on lately, and I think that's going to make a difference, hopefully. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, I, you know, a lot of it is just, you know, fixing things slowly and kind of step by step. Um, I definitely uh, appreciate all the, the feedback and all the ideas, though. Uh, that, that's super helpful. Like, um, I, I just hope you guys don't get frustrated, like, if it moves a bit slowly, because in the past, I, I've been, I tried to, like I said, kind of go go all in, and it didn't really work because. When it doesn't work out, you just get super demotivated. So now my prior priority is kind of, I guess my approach is more like running a marathon where I can slow and steady. It will take however long it takes, but we'll get there eventually.
Yeah, it got a lot better since we can use external packages like through Meteor. Yeah, um, for sure. That, that helped a lot. Yeah, I mean, one thing I mean, not, I'm... not external pack. I mean, like, just on mean... my own computer. Like, I, I have my Vulkan on my computer, but I develop in a different directory. That's what I meant. Oh, OK, OK, yeah. Yeah, yeah I see what you mean. Yeah, I think hmm, that that's, after trying a lot of different configurations of installing like repos and stuff, I think that's the best way, having the two repos, the core on one hand and your own code separate. Uh, that's what I've been doing, and it works well. Um, anything else? Is there anything else you guys would like to talk about? Something I didn't, uh, something I missed? Who do you want to, um, well, how do you want to do all the setup with the cards, the Trello cards? Oh, yeah, uh, Trello. So uh, I was looking at the Trello. Like the backlog, and you also want to change or wanted to change to Redux forms. I'm working with Redux forms since like last year, and it's it's a breeze sometimes. But sometimes when you have, for example, um, DraftJS or whatever other, if you have another component that requires external state and might maybe even internal state, that makes it hard to use. So I wouldn't. I would just get rid of that change to Redux forms. It, it seems nice, but it can be yeah. a problem. I think it's pretty much mutually exclusive with moving to Apollo client to anyways, because like either we, we rip out Redux completely or we double in on it. Like, yeah, yeah. Um... Also, the problem, same with, there's a package called Uniforms, which looks really cool. Uh, what I'm a bit scared of is depending on another package for something that's really core to Vulkan, because uh, you, know, you don't know, you don't necessarily understand it. Um, and also, it might do things you don't need. I mean, Vulkan forms, you know, it's not the best, but at least it's my own code. So if, if there's a problem, I know I can fix it, because I, I created the problem, probably. Uh, whereas Redux forms or other things, they, you might get stuck. Like you know, like Apollo is great, but if something doesn't work, uh, it's not my fault. Like, you know, what am I gonna do? Like, I'm not gonna go through the whole Apollo source code. Uh, it's not practical. So yeah, for now, I think let's keep the forms. Uh, they work well enough. You know. So yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, we, I, I should go through the. Um, oh, yeah, this one that maybe migrate to React Router four. I don't remember who it was, but someone was asking for that. I, I don't feel the need. Uh, for for me, uh, V three works, but eventually, I guess we kind of do want to catch up somehow. So. Mm -hmm. But uh, React Router 4 is very different. So actually, I think we could uh, implement it in a way that's transparent for the end users, because we use like add routes. But behind the scenes, the, the philosophy is very different. So it would take some work, I think. Also, I'm worried how it would affect like all the SSR code. So that's something I should talk oh. about. So. Uh, yeah, in Vulkan, so we do SSR, server-side rendering. And there's kind of two different difficulties with that. One is just doing the SSR itself. So that means hooking up into the router and um, and hard rating the, the components with the data and so on. And then there's a specific difficulty here, which is uh, getting the current logged in user and you know, generating a page uh, that matches them. The problem is that Meteor, it stores its token in local storage, which the server doesn't have access to. So you need to do some hacky stuff to transform that token into a cookie, I think, or something, or a header, or, or whatever. I don't know. Because yeah, the reason I don't know is I didn't write that code. Uh, it was written by, I think, Xavier and Comus uh, back then. 
So I'm very uh, wary about affecting anything in there in the like uh, Vulkan routing package and uh, Vulkan lib because I might not be able to fix it uh, right away. But the good news is, like a month ago or something, I had a hangout with um, people from Apollo and from uh, uh, Meteor, from MDG, and we talked about how to improve Meteor for Apollo. And one of the big sticking points was like uh, this whole like SSR passing the current user thing. So uh, I'm hopeful that we'll have some improvements in that area, and then maybe when they release that, we can kind of take a hard look at all the the SSR process and improve it, and maybe at that time also switch to uh, React Router for yeah. if we are kind of changing everything up. But yeah, that's that's why I don't want to. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. One question: Like, um, didn't Meteor always have, except for subscriptions, always had user ID? On the on the server, yes, but well, that's um, I don't know. I don't know if the Apollo server can access that, and you know, it's it's kind of uh, okay. Anyway, I, I mean, I, I expect it wouldn't be as simple as just doing meteor user ID because otherwise, why would we bother with the token and stuff? But also, uh, generally, we don't want to rely on anything that's too meteor specific. Like it's just a, a bad idea, I think, in the long term. Um, that's why I always tell people not to do like meteor user ID, whether it's on the client or server, even though it will work. But in the future, it it might not. Okay. Hang on. So how do how do they store it with? With Apollo, so store the the token. You mean? Yeah, token. Like they're well, so they receive the token from Meteor accounts and they store it somehow with the Apollo server. Uh, not really. So, but the thing, the the challenge is when you're doing the SSR process, you wanna know who the current user is and to do that you need to uh access the current user token somehow so you're not you don't have to store anything i mean once you have the once you know who the user is you can just get them from the database uh that that's fine um but the problem is just knowing yeah who you're talking to so not so much how you store it it's just who, mm. who who's connecting Okay. Right. That's the challenge. Um, so yeah, that is something hmm, I, I want to work on too at some point. And yeah, hopefully, like Apollo client two point oh, that doesn't require any changes on the back end. Uh, but I wouldn't expect it because it's just GraphQL, so there's no reason. Um, uh, another thing I had here, uh, get rid of simple schema. So I'm not super happy with simple schema. Like it's powerful, but there's so many like weird things, and you know it just works in a quirky way. I, I feel. Um, so I would love to get rid of it. But the question is, uh, I'm not sure what to replace it with. Um, so. Yeah, I'm open to suggestions for that. Like, basically, what it does is it validates. So currently, it only validates on the server. Um, I think, although it could validate on the client too, but I'm not sure why it doesn't. But yeah, you you want something to validate your fields, even though GraphQL already does that. Um, but there's some things like. Actually, I don't know. Like, for example, one thing some simple schema will do it can validate if a field is an email or not, or a URL or not, or matches a regular expression. Uh, I'm not sure if GraphQL can do that through directives or or something, but <laughs> it'd be interesting to know. But then, even if GraphQL could do that, it would only do it on the server. So, if we do want a client side validation a library, then we still need a JavaScript. Library of some kind. So 
yeah, down the road, um, if we can get rid of that and, and use just a more uh, lightweight validation library, uh, that, that could be good, I think. But yeah, I, I've never used anything other than simple schema because I, I am I come from media, so I'm not really aware of what uh, a regular like Express app would use. Maybe uh, Mongo, whatever mongoose. I don't know. Yeah, I'm working with mongoose, um, but I don't know if we. I'm, I'm not. I, I don't know. I'm not too deep into simple schema, but. I don't see a value in changing. The only thing is get it's getting pretty like you have all these uh, permissions and you resolvers and all that stuff. And, and I'm, not a, I'm not an expert on the on the security side of things, but you're exposing like data model. Right? Mm -hmm. So when every, when everything is dependent on a backbone, like you I, I call the simple schema a backbone in, in Vulkan. Um yeah, yeah. Um, so I mean, the, the reality is that we are not using simple schema that much anyway, as it is, because uh, a lot of it is kind of done internal, internally by Vulkan and GraphQL. So there, there's, I guess, there's three security or validation layers, whatever you want to call it. There's, well, when, when let's say you send a mutation to the server, so first it will hit the GraphQL layer. So if the arguments uh, don't correspond to the right types uh, or the right field names or whatever. It, it, it will never even hit um, the, the Vulkan code, right? It will get stopped at the GraphQL level. So that's number one. And then number two, um, Vulkan will, there's actually a file called validation.js or something. And there's like three or four steps where it kind of controls that you can modify all the fields that you're trying to modify. Uh, stuff like that, and one of these steps is actually using simple schema to validate the, the data. So uh, simple schema, as it is, is just one step among many. So that's why I feel we could probably remove it uh, because it's kind of isolated as it is. Uh, and that was a deliberate choice. Like I didn't want to rely on too much on it because I knew down the road we might get rid of it. So yeah. But again, that's the kind of change where it might have a lot of uh, implications. And there's like, the, the best case scenario is that nothing changes for the user. They don't see any difference. So it's not a super uh, you know, rewarding task to work on because you're just trying to keep things from breaking uh, while involving a lot of extra work on your part. But it's still probably good to do. And another reason is uh, it might uh, make the client side bundle smaller because I think simple schema does add a fair bit of code. When I compare my my or telescope uh, bundle to the current Vulkan bundle, that there's already a, probably like a 10x <laughs> decrease in size. Um, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not unhappy with the current size of the bundle at all. Oh, cool. But uh, yeah, that's that's really good. But we can always get it smaller. And um, I mean, also, it's just the fact that we're including a lot of code that we don't need and we don't use. So that's always always good to fix. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just looking through the Trello board. So yeah, we should. Um, uh, well, I, I should do a better job of keeping up, keeping it up to date, and actually using it. Uh, a lot of it is because I've never had like a, a real job, so it's only now I, I just taken a, <laughs> a a new job, like as a part time engineer in the company, and uh, they're making me use Trello and do like weekly meetings and stuff like that. So I'm finally kind of learning how to do that. But before that, I was just running wild by myself, basically. Yeah. If you need any help, I worked for BMW for two years, and we did uh, on a systems level the requirements management and specifications. That was kind of like heavy, but it's like Trello is is very easy. Well, I mean, that. feel free to to help me. Like if you, uh, you know, any feedback on. 
how to better use Trello, or if, if I do something and you can be like, hey, you didn't add it to the Trello board, or <laughs> hey, you haven't added the columns for the new versions or whatever. Oh, I, I another think. thing I'm seeing here was actually very important, uh, user accounts. Right now, we are depending on Meteor, like 100%. So just to, to break it down, there's a, first of all, uh, where the user accounts uh, are stored. So they're stored in the database in Mongo according to like the, the format that's defined by Meteor and the, the, you know, so we're not using like Passport or anything else. We're using Meteor accounts. So that's something that could change down the road, but for now, uh, probably not. But then there's also how you actually uh, communicate um, with the backend and, and, and authenticate and all that. And that currently is done through DDP. So Meteor is like a data layer, which is kind of dumb because we have Apollo, we have GraphQL. So it's it feels like redundant to have these two data layers. And keeping DDP just for user accounts is, is kind of a bummer. So I would like to migrate that to Apollo or GraphQL, rather. Um, and there are some packages that uh, uh, well, I guess there's one package that does it, but I need to investigate more. And then the third layer, I guess, is the UI layer. So, so we use uh, the Vulkan accounts package, which is a fork of uh, STD accounts UI, which has to be like the, the worst written code I've ever seen in my life. Like, <laughs> it's like one component that's like 1,000 lines of code that does everything. Uh, from showing you the UI to like callbacks to, you know, it, it's just a mess. I didn't know at the time. I was naive. I, I thought if nobody would ever put out a package that's not perfectly written, right? Why would somebody do that? Uh, but I've learned a lot about open source since then. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. Um, I want to rewrite that. Hmm? Which package is that? Studio so from Studio Interact. Uh, it's yeah. I think I thought I should, yes. Exactly. Okay. Um, I mean, you know, I, I say that. Of course, I'm super grateful for for these guys for actually writing the package and it works well. But like. And maybe you know we did I added like kind of fork it so maybe since then they they improved it but yeah I was not happy when I looked at the code my God mm. uh, then again you know it's yeah, it's not an easy task like there's so many different form states and stuff but um, I would rather have a form that does less but is easy to understand that than a huge thing that tries to do everything. Also uh, with zero comments. Yeah, as yes. for DDP, um, I'm working with a company here that does not work with Meteor at all. Um, because they don't have DDP, they have to rely on Firebase. They want live updates on the user accounts, so they keep a lot of things in Firebase, even their messaging system, just to have that working. Uh, um, why do you want to get rid of DDP? Well, so for example, uh, let's say you want to develop a, a React Native app that connects to your uh, uh, Vulkan backend. You know, currently, for the all your data, it works seamlessly with like Apollo client on the for React Native or or iOS or whatever. But when it comes to user accounts, then you you'll have to kind of work it out differently because it, it just you know it's just a completely different way of connecting and authenticating and getting your data. So that just feels bad. Like it should be consistent, right? Uh, you should like logging in and, and resetting your password, and all these should be just GraphQL mutations. I think. As, I don't think it matters that much that the real time aspect of of user because the, the fact is we're already fetching user data via via GraphQL, you know. Um, so we don't get any um, uh, real time benefits there anyway. The only thing that's not done through GraphQL is the initial uh, authentication. 
So if you, if you type in your console like uh, uh, meteor .user, meteor .user, you'll get some basic data. And that's the thing that we get through the DP. And then if you want more data than that, you now, then you use fragments and GraphQL and the, the kind of normal way of doing things. So it's just the, just having these two different ways, that's what annoys me. Okay. And also, you know, if we can get rid of the DDP dependency altogether, then we can uh, avoid having to load in on the client. We can also get rid of mini Mongo. Um, it, it will be a lot better, I think. It but again, like you want to, yeah. sounds like you want to strip down from Meteor to Express, <laughs> like a like a, a Feathers JS kind of setup. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's another great point. Uh, thanks for bringing that up. Like, my my goal would be to migrate away from Meteor, like ideally. But the the thing I think, practically speaking, I think Meteor is improving faster than. Uh, you know, or rather, it's improving fast enough to always make me question whether we need to migrate away from it. And I think eventually it will be good enough that we don't need to. So I'm just going to wait a little bit more. But I also think that Meteor itself, like, it's going to move in that direction where it's just like Feathers JS or, or like Next.js, where it's like a build tool and a server and doesn't really uh, have much to say about the client or the data layer or anything like that at all. And that, that's perfect for us because uh, we can use Apollo for all that. So I think there's kind of a you know convergence between what we need and what Meteor is doing, and what other players are doing as well. But that does mean I want to anticipate that and and already kind of prepare um, you know lay the bed for when all that happens, so that we are not like caught uh, flat-footed and by relying too much on things that. I think, well, one are bad and two are maybe might go away. So I don't know if mini Mongo and DDP and all that will actually go away, but I think they're just not going to be maintained that much going forward. I think MDG is not going to focus on them much. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, it's kind of it's bad for the traditional meteor community because these are the things that. Uh, appealed to people, but I think it's good for us because these are things that we replace and we can uh, try to do better anyway. Hmm. So if you want to have a build tool which is not a meteor, you have to rely on other, like Webpack or something else, which is... Oh, well, really... I, I, I do want to keep meteor as a build tool. Like, Yeah, well, I guess what I mean is, ideally, if, if I could snap my hands and we would switch to Webpack and Next.js, um, and all that, I would do it. But since I think Meteor is going to become something like Webpack and Next.js anyway, I think we can actually just wait and uh, it kind of eventually the distinction won't really make that much sense, you know, because they'll both be hopefully just as performant and both do more or less the same things. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Even though right now Meteor, is still kind of halfway in that world where it's trying to do everything and gives you lots of extra dependencies and has mini Mongo and DDP and this and that. Down the road, I think it won't be a problem. Or, you know, it could be a problem for other people, but for us, it will be good. <laughs> OK. Um, well, I kind of know my task with the Apollo client. Yep. <laughs> Um, is there, like, how did you communicate the change usually with Xavier or someone else? Like, let's say, because I'm, e even if I read about it and I implement it, I still need some exchange on what I'm doing. Sort of. uh, I mean, Slack, you know, um, just, yeah, that's, that's all I have, uh, that's all we use. Uh, I think the best thing to do is you know just create a new branch and then just keep me posted uh, or, or even not just me just post in Devel in the Devel chat room mm -hmm. uh, with whatever you're working on any questions uh, anything you learn 
I, I think it's good to have a pretty like open uh, workflow where you just post things as you as it goes. There's not that many of us that it would be un unmanageable. So for now, I think we can just take it like pretty informally like that. Okay. And then we can switch to the BMW method uh, later on. <laughs> I, I don't think you want to. <laughs> Uh, it's it's um, like since it's only one platform and not three platforms with seven different products or eight different products now, and a hybrid version and a battery version, uh, you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so Luca, you can uh, look into the the bootstrap thing, maybe using style yep. components. Um. That's great. Uh, Steven, I don't know if you if there's anything specific you want to do or just, you know. Yeah, it's also fine to do some reading first, and then we'll decide what we are going to do down the road. OK. And it's also fine to just I was take. Working up. Yeah. 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 I can't hear you. OK. Couldn't hear you very well, but that's fine. So. Um, yeah, thanks for joining. Uh, feel free to, like, if I forget to do anything I mentioned here, feel free to remind me. Um, I'm not super organized, but I try try my best. So, yeah, a ton of thanks for being part of the Vulcan community, uh, for tuning in today. Anybody watching this later on, uh, thanks for watching. And uh, feel free to drop by the Slack chat room if you have uh, any questions or any comments about Vulcan. This is going to be like 